I'd been in the cadets, so so I knew, I knew how to handle a rifle, and I knew about more or less about army ways, you know. But I hadn't experienced them in the in the in the adult world, which was quite different. <laughs> in the cadets, one could speak English. Um, when you joined the army, you could speak English, provided you made a, a rude word between each syllable. Uh, <laughs> Then we did, I think, six weeks there, sort of marching around and being shouted at and all the rest of it, um, which didn't disturb me much. I thought it was an awful waste of time. In a way. I couldn't understand how people could do that all their life, you know. Um, and then they said, what do, you want to, what do you want to do? You can join the infantry, or you can join the signals, or you can join the tanks. So the infantry sounded ever so boring. And, and not much fun. The tanks, I can remember in, in the Libyan desert in, in, the, in the war watching the films and the photographs of tanks being, they call it brewed up. Um, that somebody threw a, a bomb or something at them and they burst into flames and all the in, people inside were just burnt to death. So I thought, well, it doesn't sound very jolly. So, I, <laughs> but signals um, was the third, third choice, really. I said, well, right, I'll, be a, I'll join the signals. So they sent me to Catterick Camp. And, and they, 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 there, was, there was more marching around and being shouted at. I can remember very vividly one day coming from the train to Kemmel Lines because all the, all, Catterick was a great town and, and divided into little hamlets. And each little hamlet was was called after a battle, mostly mostly battles of the First World War, and this particular time was we were marching up to to um, Kemmel lines, Kemmel being one of the, uh, the important battles in the in the First World War, and and um, it was snowing and the snow was on the ground, and I looked across the field and, and there were telegraph poles in the field, and. You know how telegraph poles for a pole like that with crosses? Well, these were buried in the snow right up to the crosses. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> See, what's this going to be like? But uh, after a few weeks, you one realised after the thaw that in fact the telegraph poles were only up for the crosses so that we students could climb up <laughs> just two or three feet and fiddle around with the things you had to fiddle around with, the wires on the top and the instructing sergeant could walk up and down and see what we were doing. But that was, that was really quite a, quite, a, quite a thought, you know, that these telegraph poles were buried up to, their, up to their top knots. In those days, the major form of communication in the, in the army um, was the teleprinter. And the teleprinter, you had to... It's like a typewriter that sent its messages over the, over the telephone. So they, they taught us how to type. But they didn't teach us any decent sort of typing, not, not how to type a letter or anything. You had to type um, in cipher, and the ciphers were groups of five letters. And you had a whole page of groups of five letters like that. And you, you had to type them um, accurately with the keys blanked out. Um, and there wasn't any competition about how fast you could go, because the teleprinter is limited in its speed. You can only do about 60 words a minute at the, at the maximum. So we all sat in freezing classrooms <laughs> doing this for hours on end to, to, to get ourselves reasonably skilled in, in, in typing these wretched five, five groups of five letters all the time. Well, then I was sent to a, a WASBY. What's a WASBY, she says? Well, <laughs> it's, called, it's short for War Office Selection Board. And I, I didn't know what it's all about. I was sent to Hazelworth, Hazelhurst in Sussex. Um, and we were set all sorts of t tests and things. Uh, and I didn't realise at the end that most of the tests we had didn't have an answer. <laughs> they just wanted to see how you approached it, not, not whether you got the right answer, because there wasn't the right answer. How to cross this river is full of crocodiles and you've only got a rope and a <laughs> or whatever you to, to do it, which is totally impossible. But they wanted to see whether, in fact, you could you were taking charge of the group and, 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 and being sensible. You know, after a bit, they 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 sent me the king's commission, which, which is, you know, His Majesty King George the Sixth has the great pleasure of offering you a pip. <laughs> so, 
So that, that's how that happened. The downside was you had to gen spend six weeks in Mons Barracks. And there there was the, the officer cadet training school where you had to spend six weeks, again being shouted at and all the rest of it, <laughs> under, the, under Sergeant Major Ronald Britton. We were demoted really from private to pit because it, you really are the dog's body when you're, when you're a single pipper. As my father discovered when he went over the top. And, and um, he um, uh, uh, was asked where we'd like to go. Well, I knew there was a signals department in Washington, so I said Washington. Uh, and, and the second choice, I knew there was one in Tokyo as well, so I said, what about Tokyo? Well, they, they all wrote it down on their clipboards and disappeared. And when my posting came through, it was for Lisbon. Well, I thought well, that was super, that was, that was even better really, because I, you know, Portugal sounds a nice sort of place to be in. And, and, um, but anyway, eventually I discovered that it was another Lisbon altogether. It's Lisbon in, in County Antrim in, in, in Northern Ireland. <laughs> so I, I was posted there. I didn't know that Northern Ireland was potentially a dangerous place for a soldier. <laughs> it didn't, that didn't cross my mind at all. The first night I spent in, in Northern Ireland, just like Sanders of the River, you know, the drums, bum, 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 like that all most, most of the night. The, the famous drum or drums, where they're huge, great drums, like, like the, the drum you have on your, in the, in the, in the, in the marching soldiers, where they struck them with sticks, with his, boom, 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 like that, and they kept on for hours and hours on the end. And that was the, that was the Protestants um, being nasty to the Catholic sort of thing, you know. And, and, I thought, well, this is a jungle. <laughs> but that was, that's another thing that struck me quite sharply. I was given an office, a totally bare thing with a table and a chair. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and I was, apparently I was a signals officer. Well, I have no idea what a signals officer should, do, should be doing because nobody told me. And the, the other officers in the, in, the, in the little group were totally inaccessible. I never ever, never ever met the colonel in charge, um, so I, I, I looked around and the dispatch riders were coming, the dispatch riders were going, and it was all being wrote in a little book and they'd been doing it for 20 years without me. I thought, well, <laughs> I'll let them get on with it rather than interfere. And that was how it was all the way through, really. I wanted to do medicine as a career, um, but I'd... I'd fluffed one of the exams um, that I had to take at school. And, and so I, I needed to do that again. But I found I couldn't, I couldn't stu study as a, as a soldier because the life was too communal and there was no, pri no privacy at all. And, and that worried me a bit. Anyway, I discovered after a bit that I was also education officer. Well, well that's far away, well, that's more my line. And I w was able to organise myself a course at, at Queen's University um, to retake the exam I'd fluffed at, at school. And that was good, but I didn't know how to get there, I didn't know where it was. But fortunately I found myself that I was also MT officer, which involved looking after the, the motor vehicles of the unit, so I could organise myself for transport there. So that was, that was the two positive things that happened there. I remember being given a loaded gun. Well, I wouldn't know what to do with a loaded gun, would you? <laughs> and told to go to the bank and pick up the money for the, for the, for the soldiers' wages, the impressed money. And, and I didn't know that, that, that Northern Ireland was a hotbed of <laughs> republicanism and all the other sort of factions that go around fighting each other. Um, uh, so I trotted off to the bank and I thought to myself afterwards or later on, Supposing something incident had happened, you know, what, what would I have done? <laughs> would I have drawn, shot somebody with this loaded gun and started the Third World War or something? <laughs> I don't know. And the same thing happened again. There, there was some secret equipment that had to be escorted from Ireland to to somewhere in England. I forget where it was now. Um, and they they, needed, they gave me a gun again and a, and a couple of couple of signalmen to escort this thing on board ship um, across to England and then down to Chippenham or somewhere. 
and, and I think it had a loaded gun. I have no idea what to do with this beastly gun except put it under the pillow and hope it looks all right. <laughs> but, you know, without any instructions at all, well, any help, whatever, I was, I was given quite a, an important job to do. And, and I, I, you know, I did it, but, but I, later on, uh, when I got more mature sort of thing, I thought, well, is that really a responsible way to, to handle that situation? The incompetence of the superiors and how hierarchies work. And a good example is the, the colonel in charge decided that he'd like to have six command vehicles. Now, a command vehicle is quite a quite a quite a thing. Really, it's it's it's, it's more than just a truck. And he had ordered six of these things. And and I said, well, where am I going to park them? He said, well, park them in the square outside. So I did. And then. About three or four months later, he decided he, he didn't want them after all, having just been parked on the square. And then, then was a time when I discovered that the RESC, the Service Corps, had um, used them as a nice mine for spare parts. <laughs> so I had, I had thoughts of poor little me with my 13 shillings a day, um, being, having to spend the rest of my life paying for all this stuff. Oh, but the Lance Corporal, my Lance Corporal, um, said, don't worry, I'll fix it. So what he couldn't re-steal from the service corps, he made. <laughs> he made tarpaulins, he made shovels, he made screwdrivers. And when, when the inspection came, it passed. <laughs> so my thoughts are, thank goodness for Sergeant, for Lance Corporal, so super. <laughs> the way of discharge was also totally incompetent. So it had a message, apparently, from from um, the signal school in, in Catherick that our unit was to send, a, send somebody to attend a cipher course in Catterick camp. So I was sent um, because it was, uh, I wouldn't be missed I suppose. <laughs> so I was sent to Catterick camp, a familiar place that Catterick camp was, uh, and um, I settled down for the night. And the next morning we were summoned for this cipher course and somebody came with a big document that I had to sign. It was the Official Secrets Act. I thought, <laughs> I don't really want many of your secrets because I'm going to be demobbed next week. So I explained this to them and they, and they were quite, quite shocked, I think, to think that I was sent on a secret cipher course a week before I was to be demobbed. It's all quite a, an introduction into life, really, you know. And I got through it all right. I, I was still alive and I wasn't tested and I wasn't sent to any war term. I had did no fighting, um, which I was grateful for. It may well be if I'd been involved in Malaya or Korea, some of my friends were in Korea um, and, and were killed and were wounded and came back without a hand, you know, all that sort of stuff. I was discharged with the knowledge of Morse code knowledge of how telephones worked, knowledge how, of how to cross over the wires in the, telephone, at the top of a telegraph pole, and, and knowledge of how a wireless worked, uh, which is useful knowledge. So there was a positive answer in the end, I suppose. I grew up a bit as well, because you would between 18 and 20s. You'd grow up anyway, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm.